Okay, thank you. Thank, uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me here. Uh, okay, good. Okay, uh, I'll first start with uh, modular arithmetic. So this uh, may or may not be familiar to you, uh, but in some form uh, you've already seen this. So let me fix uh, notation here. <coughs> For integers, I will use uh, z. So z is equal to set of integers. And so uh, the simplest example of uh, modular arithmetic is something you're familiar with, uh, which, sorry? Right bigger, okay. Uh, so uh, the familiar thing that I'm trying to uh, talk about now is just uh, what I would, one would say clock arithmetic, which mathematically we would say is, uh, uh, modular arithmetic for n equal to 12. So this is uh, integers modulo 12 or 24, depending on what clock you're using. So uh, this is something familiar in the sense that, uh, say, at a given instant, the time is uh, 9 o'clock. And then uh, what would be the time 10 hours from that instant? Then uh, instead of saying 19, you would say 7 because you just subtract 12 from it and you come back to uh, the numbers between 0 and 12, uh, <coughs> between 1 and 12. So you'll say it's 7 o'clock. Uh, of course, if you're using a 24-hour clock, you might still say 17, but then I can still rephrase the question. Suppose the time at a given instance is 17 hours, then what is the time 10 hours later? And instead of saying 27, you will again subtract 24 and you'll say it's 3. It's the 0, 3 hours. So formally, what I would do is uh, I would look at uh, the set of all times or, uh, okay, so I'm only interested in the integer part, so I'm not interested in 12.30 and 11.45 and those kind of things. So uh, I would look at integers from uh, 0, 1, sorry, starting from 0 all the way up to 11. So actually when we do uh, when we use uh, clocks arithmetic, sometimes we use 12 instead of 0. But uh, for doing arithmetic, uh, 12 is uh, not so convenient, and 0 somehow is more natural. So instead of 12, I have thrown in 0 there. So this is the collection of numbers. And we declare A, where A is an element from this set. So this is the, this is the uh, set of integers modulo 12. So you take A in this set, and you define A plus B and you define it to be either a plus b if it is uh, less than or equal to less than 12, or you define it to be a plus b minus 12 if, if, it is, if a plus b is greater than or equal to 12. So that is how you would define addition, and this is uh, sort of addition for the, these numbers. <coughs> So more generally, we can also rephrase this by saying that a plus b is nothing but, so plus as in for this set, a plus b is nothing but, you do the usual addition, and look at the remainder modulo 12. So what you're really looking at is just the remainder modulo 12. So both the cases come under that. So just add the two numbers and look at the remainder modulo 12. Uh, remainder after dividing by 12. A remainder has to be in this set, and that's what you look at. So more generally, so similarly, For any <coughs> number, any integer n, the set of mod n integers is the set 0. As you can guess, it is 0, 1, all the way to n minus 1. 
And then you define addition the same way. Uh, a plus B is uh, whatever you do. Uh, just uh, <coughs> just add the two numbers and then look at the remainder modulo, uh, remainder after dividing by n. And it's not just plus. You can also define uh, uh, multiplication uh, in the same way. Take two numbers from here, multiply them, and then look at the remainder mod after dividing by n, and that is your uh, final output. So plus and multiplication are defined in the same way. And so this is what is called, what I would denote as z mod nz. Uh, we'll come up with a slightly more compact notation for it uh, very shortly, but this is what we denoted. Uh, what it means is that in some sense, uh, nz, all multiples of n, so this notation is all multiples of n, and what we are trying to say is that all multiples of n are being treated as zero. And so in fact, if you want, you can also slightly abstractly, you can say that, okay, this looks like uh, all multiples of n, because, I mean, in some sense, if, even if you go back to the clock thing, zero just means, 12 also means 24, 36, 48, all those things. So no matter how many hours later you count, or you can even go backwards in time, and how many hours before you want to go, all multiples of 12 really correspond to 0. So keeping that in mind, I will look at all multiples of n. The notation is nz, and I'll call this element as nz. And I'll think of this element as all those numbers whose remainder after dividing by n is 1. So those are all multiples of n plus 1. This is the notation I'll use and so on and so forth. So I can call this as this. So this symbol, actually, if you want, you can think of it as representing this whole, this entire set of all those numbers whose remainder after dividing by n is n minus 1. Uh, one reason for, uh, I mean, this kind of way of writing it uh, turns out to be a little more flexible. You can use it in other contexts. So it's a little more general way of doing things. And again, if you want to multiply or add two elements, you just take this entire set and add it to this entire set. And then what you'll get is, again, a similarly big set like that. But that will just correspond to a number here only. And it's the same thing that you would like to say. Namely, take two numbers, add them, or multiply them, whatever operation you're doing. And then <coughs> take the remainder after dividing by n. So just to give an example, so I have not writing too many things formally. I'll just say addition and multiplication defined in the obvious way. So just to give an example, suppose n is 7. Then I'm looking at z mod 7z. And that has exactly 7 elements. And say, if you want to look at 3 times 4, then in this set, 3 times 4, which is 12, is nothing but 5. So in fact, sometimes we say that 3 times 4 is congruent to 5 modulo 7 after dividing by 7. Whatever, this is a compact way of saying it. Just 3 times 4 is 5. And similarly, 2 times uh, 4 is 1, and so on and so forth, etc. So for example, you can also think of 6 as minus 1. And uh, though minus 1 is not strictly speaking a symbol used for this set, but 6 behaves like minus 1. So 6 square is minus 1 square is 1. You can check it directly. 6 square is 36 divided by 7 is 1. So once you get used to it, it's pretty simple, because it just behaves like integers and just keep replacing by the uh, remainders. So one basic theorem I'll state here, which I will not prove, but uh, it is easy to prove, uh, but still requires a little bit of uh, uh, some facts. So if uh, n, is a, n, n is a prime number, if and only if, maybe I'll write like this, <coughs> every non-zero element A in Z mod NZ, but non-zero is important, has a multiplicative inverse. So that means there is an element b such that a times b is 1. So for example, 2 has a multiplicative inverse 4, because 2 times 4 is 1. The multiplicative inverse of 3 
uh, is going to be maybe five. Yeah, three times five is one. So and so on and so forth. So uh, because seven was a prime, you could do it. But in Z mod six Z, you cannot do it. So for example, Z mod six Z two times three is zero. So it's easy to see that two and three don't have multiplicative inverses. So whether or not it has a multiplicative inverse depends on the number n. And uh, so if n is prime, uh, then uh, every, every non-zero element has a multiplicative inverse. Uh, n is not a prime. <coughs> For example, 2 is an even number, and uh, 2 times anything else will be even. Its remainder modulo 6 will also be even. So you can never get 1. This is one way of arguing it. Similarly, you can argue something about e. So three will not have a multiplicative inverse. It's hard to, it's easy to see all these things. And so this theorem is basically a easy property of uh, prime numbers. And uh, abstractly we say that uh, this <coughs> Z mod NZ, if N is a prime, is a field. Uh, so before that, let me just uh, uh, say that when N is a prime, so from now on, if N is a prime, Uh, we use, we also use uh, FP. So let me, instead of N, uh, psychologically it's easier to, or uh, it's better to use P symbol. So if P is a prime number, we also use FP to denote Z mod PZ. So FP is a set of all, so for example, F2 in particular might be something which uh, you may have seen, especially if you are doing some computer science courses, because it consists of exactly two symbols, 0 and 1. 1 plus 1 is 0, and 0 plus 0 is 0 anyway. 0 times 1 is 0. So this is just a set of two symbols. This is <coughs> the binary field. Addition, multiplication, and all are defined as usual here. And so we say that, uh, so we also they say that such things are called fields. These are examples of of what is called as a field, which I'm not going to define, but it just means a collection of, uh, it's a set which has a multiplication and an addition, and these things behave in the obvious way that you would like them to behave. Uh, obvious means that just some basic properties, addition, multiplication, they are commutative, associative, uh, any, any, <coughs> there are some standard properties. So one thing you can do with these is, uh, for example, with these kind of fields also, you can do a little bit of linear algebra. And that turns out to be somewhat useful. Uh, so linear algebra means you can define vector spaces. Uh, so they are just copies of the same field several times. And you can define matrices, determinants. You can uh, talk about linear independence, basis. You can talk about uh, eigenvalues, eigenvectors. So many things you can do. Uh, perhaps the only things uh, which you can do are those which have to do with angles and lengths over real numbers. So those things you cannot really expect them to carry over, but most of the basic symbolic manipulations that you learn in linear algebra, they can be carried over all the way here. So for example, a uh, vector space of dimension D would be D copies of this field. Now how many elements does this field have? The field has P elements. Remember, FP is 0, 1, all the way up to p minus 1. So fp has p elements. So how many p elements will this field have? Uh, this, this is not a field, so this is a vector space. This is an example of a vector space over a field. How many elements will this set have, fp to the power d? p power d. So this has p power d elements. And for example, <coughs> uh, you can define a linear map between two such vector spaces of different dimensions, and that linear map can be represented by a matrix, and you can talk about all those things. So uh, uh, 
I'll give one sample question. Uh, so for example, if I give you, okay, so <clears throat> let's, uh, let me uh, address one simple issue here. Um, what would be, uh, so you have heard of, you have read about subspaces and all that, right? right? Dimension of subspaces, or you're yet to reach to that place. So uh, one dimensional subspace. So this is a vector space, and inside it, I'm interested in a one dimensional subspace, for example. What would that mean? That would mean I will take one non-zero vector and look at all the multiples, all the scalar multiples of that non-zero vector. But where are my scalars from? My scalars are from this field here. And so there are p scalars. So I will take one non-zero vector and I will multiply it with, with all the scalars. And so I'll get p vectors. So one dimensional vector space has p elements in it. One dimensional subspace. as p elements, out of which one of the elements is a zero vector, which is 0, 0, 0 in all the coordinates. And similarly, uh, r-dimensional vectors for subspace will have uh, p to the power r elements. And that's not hard to show. And uh, so an easy exercise <coughs> is to, uh, OK, one thing you can ask is, how many one-dimensional subspaces are there? See, now this, is, this being a finite set, you can ask these questions, which you cannot ask over real numbers, because over real numbers, if I ask you in R2, how many are there? How many subspaces are there? There are infinitely many subspaces. But uh, over a finite set, that's not the case. There will be only finitely many subspaces. And so how many one-dimensional subspaces are there in this vector space? <coughs> so uh, one-dimensional vector space corresponds to all multiples of one vector. Every non-zero vector here will give you a one-dimensional subspace by looking at all its multiples. So you take, how many elements are there? p to the power t elements. So every non-zero vector means you will have so many non-zero vectors. Each one of them will give you a subspace having p elements. So all those p elements, or all the non-zero elements out of that one-dimensional subspace, so all the p minus one elements of that are getting counted extra number of times. And so the number of one-dimensional subspaces is this much. Does that make sense? So I looked at how many elements are there. That is, how many non-zero elements are there. This is p to the power d minus 1. Each one of them is giving me a subspace. But there is an overlap, because its non-zero multiple will also give you the same subspace. So that overlap is being counted p minus 1 times, because each one-dimensional subspace has p elements, and one of those elements is 0, but all the other elements are non-zero, and they are all getting counted extra number of times. So if you think about it, you will see that this is the number of one-dimensional subspaces is equal to number of one-dimensional subspaces So one can do many such counting exercises, and it is useful for certain purposes. But now I'll abruptly uh, stop this topic and move on to the next one. So the next one is uh, perspective drawing. If you didn't understand this, you can again ask me. I mean, you can, I can explain one more time. OK, so I'll move on. Perspective drawing. So perspective, OK, this is my weakest point, because I'm not so good at drawing. Uh, so this is nothing but uh, the idea that if you are looking at a three-dimensional picture, and you want to draw it in two dimensions, and you have a whole bunch of uh, things which have uh, parallel structures, like buildings and rail lines and all, then you should draw them in a particular way to get a realistic effect. You all must be familiar with this. And if you have been better at drawing than me, definitely you would have uh, uh, learned the technique or <coughs> whatever is there. So I brought this uh, wooden log here just for that. So basically, here's one way of uh, uh, drawing a bunch of uh, uh, railway tracks going all the way to 
infinity, so to, like, so to speak. So Actually, I need a more, few more lines, but uh, I have drawn them on a sheet of paper, so maybe I'll just spare you the details. And so basically what you do is uh, you draw these lines here, and then so this is one track, and then the next one is somewhere here. Oops, sorry. All right, so that's pretty good. And then we can go on like this. And you keep drawing this uh, like this, uh, you'll get a realistic effect of uh, tracks going towards infinity, uh, infinitely many long, I mean, as long as you want. And so this is how uh, this uh, drawing like this gives you a better effect. So just before coming here, on a sheet of paper, I drew a few things. So I'll just show you. I hope you can see it from here. Again, with my limited skills, I just uh, looked up some sites to websites to give me better <coughs> hints on how to draw this. So this is, for example, what I did. And this is called, can you see it from there? So this is uh, one point perspective, meaning that there is basically one vanishing point, and this is called a vanishing point. And from you draw all the parallel lines, uh, <coughs> like these are the two parallel railway tracks, which want to meet there, you just draw them starting from here. So that gives you a good effect. And then on the side, I have drawn some uh, poles, et cetera. Uh, similarly, suppose you want to, so here's I will quickly attempt a two-point, maybe I can just show it to you. This is what is called as a two-point projection. So I want to draw, I hope you can see this. You can't see it? OK, I'll draw it. But uh, on this sheet of paper, so I should have taken a much bigger sheet, I guess, because uh, OK, I'll tell you what two-point projection is. <clears throat> so first of all, hmm. I'll need a longer this thing than this. So this is called as a line at horizon. And now we'll do a two-point projection. So these are the two points. and. Basically, I'm standing somewhere in the middle, and one side, so I have a cube or some cubical cuboid object in hand, and one side is facing this way, one side is facing this way, so the parallel sides are going to infinity in this direction. So, okay, let's see. All right, we are drawing this. Ah, oh, okay, yeah. Oops. Almost there, and then I just do this. And uh, this almost shows, so this is actually the cube. I hope you can see this part. And now just to show the top part, so as you can see, we are sort of, we seem to be seeing it from above. And so to draw the top part, again, I draw this line here. And again, I draw this line here. Oops, so this is not long enough, but anyway, let's see. Yeah. All right. So that's uh, pretty much it. And now you just sort of uh, erase, uh, you sort of uh, clean your tracks, uh, hide your tracks how you came, and just put this in solid. So that's your, uh, that's what is called as a two point projection. And uh, now I'm not going to do the three point projection, but. Uh, Basically, in this projection, uh, we are not really showing too much about uh, 
Uh, if you want to say, for example, view a, a skyscraper or a tall building from the height, then actually uh, some more modification has to be made. And uh, so three-point projection means I will actually have a point here. And then uh, these lines will actually converge. So actually, I should slant them up, and they'll converge here and here, these two lines. So that will be a three-point projection. Uh, sorry, uh, Shiva, but uh, this is an example of a three. It's not very different from here, but I have put the three dots here, and basically, this is what you do. Yeah, I can pass it around. Don't peep on the other side uh, that somebody's uh, okay junk uh, work. Anyway, okay, yeah, sure. I can pass it. Should I pass it now? Yeah, okay. You can just have a look at the pages. There's not much in it. I mean, anyway, this is uh, basically drawing 101, meaning this is the first baby course in drawing. And uh, that's when I gave up on drawing. My son is pretty good, so I could have asked him to do it. But uh, when parents get pretty excited about their children's talents, uh, they decide that it's time to do something else. So <clears throat> I decided not to bother him. OK. Uh, so anyway, <clears throat> what has this got to do with mathematics? As you can see, we are, I mean, the uh, once, uh, see, this technique must have been there around for ages. Uh, I think uh, in all the ancient uh, um, art, <clears throat> but really, I think it became uh, more systematic or became sort of a very formal method only probably in the last 500 years uh, during Renaissance time. And uh, that's when uh, people started asking mathematical questions also. Exactly what is happening? Where, what are these points at infinity? And uh, what can you say uh, if you have an object in three space and you project it? So basically, it's very clear what we are doing is we have a three-dimensional object in front of us and we have a two-dimensional plane between us and the object, and we are trying to project the image of that on that two-dimensional plane. That's obviously what we are trying to do. So then the question is, uh, if you move that plane around, then how will the figure change? And uh, what are the basic properties which are still preserved? So all these questions uh, finally led to a, some sort of a mathematical theory. And <clears throat> this mathematical theory goes by the name of projective geometry. So several people contributed to it, so I will not uh, uh, talk about its history because anyway, I'm not very qualified to do so. But I can talk about projective geometry. So now this, the third part is uh, projective geometry. So to do so, uh, to talk about projective geometry, I'll need to introduce some notation, which will be convenient. Here, R is real numbers. And more generally, uh, Rn, I will also sometimes write as uh, ANR. And I'll call it as affine space. Sorry, affine n space. This is just terminology. It doesn't mean anything. It's still Rn only, your usual Rn. OK, so that's, that's Rn. And uh, I'm now going to do the following. We are going to introduce points at infinity. And the idea is motivated by these drawings, where these were so-called vanishing points. And so we are going to introduce points at infinity in all possible directions. Okay, So the way we'll do it initially will look a bit abstract, but then I'll explain it. So initially, so I'll call this as PNR. And this, is, this will be equal to ANR. This should be thought of as the affine space plus and point at infinity. So this is what I'm interested in. So I'll give one slightly obscure looking definition, which is convenient to say at this stage, but then uh, we'll reinterpret it. So the obscure looking definition is this is a set of all, well, it's not so obscure, but it's a bit confusing. So it's a set of all uh, lines through the origin.
maybe I should call it zero. In R n plus one. So that doesn't quite sound like it is it's what I am hinting towards. I am saying that this is going to be n space plus points at infinity, but this looks like a slightly strange construction. I'm looking at all lines through the origin through uh, through the origin in Rn plus 1. So uh, in terms of in linear algebraic terms, you can also think of this as or. So if this is so because this concept of line might uh, become a little confusing when we come because we are really interested in coming back here. So I can also think of this as or all one dimensional subspaces in Rn plus 1. The line is nothing but a subspace. It's a set preserved under multiplication, addition, scalar multiplication and addition. And uh, it's one dimensional because it's basically given by one non zero vector. Ah, the board was wet when I wrote here, that's why. So, uh, I've given the definition, but now we'll reinterpret. We'll think a little bit, more, little bit more algebraically what it really means. So, you can also think of, therefore, you can also think of P and R as... <coughs> See, what we have done is we are looking at lines through the origin or one-dimensional subspaces, but what's a one-dimensional subspace or a line through the origin? You pick one non-zero vector and look at all its multiples. That's what it is. So you might as well give that non-zero vector. So I will write down that non-zero vector. I'm not putting the brackets, I'll put that shortly. But really, that vector is not uniquely determining that subspace or that line. You could have taken a multiple of that vector also, and that will also give you the same line. So therefore, you shouldn't really look at that vector, you should just look at the ratio of all the coordinates of that vector simultaneously. That will determine the line. So therefore, keeping that in mind, I will introduce the ratio symbol here, colons. And I'll write like this. And what it means is that this, this notation is supposed, somehow supposed to mean that it's a, um, it's a class of elements, meaning that I am allowed to multiply all these numbers simultaneously by one scalar, because I can take a vector and look at its multiple also. So if I have a line, and this is the origin, if I give you a vector, I can take two times that vector, or 1.5 times that vector, or minus half times that vector, and they will all determine that line. That line is determined by any non-zero vector on that, on that line, or on that subspace. So therefore, this symbol here is also equal to, by definition, lambda a1, lambda a2, lambda an plus 1, for any scalar lambda. So where lambda is in real numbers, but not 0. 0 I'm not taking because I don't want to take the origin. Origin will not determine the line, but any non-zero vector will determine a line. So this is what I'm looking at. I'm looking at collection of all simultaneous n plus 1 ratios. That's the same as taking a line. And now you would ask, how does that give me a, n, r, and points at infinity? It's still not obvious. So now we'll work our way uh, step by step. So n equal to 1. So let's start with n equal to 1.
So what is P1R? So in that case, there are only two terms, n is equal to 1. So I'll just think of this as a colon b, ratio of two numbers, where a and b are in the, real, in the set of all real numbers. And they are not both simultaneously 0. One of them is at least non-zero, because I'm looking at non-zero vectors. So P1R is this collection. But what's the ratio of two numbers? That's just a number. So it's, in fact, R. Almost. The ratio of two numbers is just a number. So in other words, you can think of this as A over B. Except if B was 0. So if B was 0, then you can't. So the, you can think of this as A over B if B is not 0. And if B is 0, then it turns out you are left with only one point. Because if b is 0, then you have a colon 0, but a colon 0 is the same as 1 colon 0, because you can divide by a. You can multiply or divide by any number. So therefore, what I've done is I've looked at all possible ratios, which is nothing but all possible real numbers, thinking of first number divided by second number. And the only ratio that I've not gotten is the infinity ratio, because 1 over 0 is not doesn't make sense in real numbers. So I have introduced this infinity ratio here. And therefore, this is nothing but the set of all real numbers, union, a new symbol, infinity. And so I have introduced infinity as a concept inside my set. Of, with, uh, I have introduced infinity as a new symbol to the set of all real numbers. And this is actually a more systematic way of doing it. One systematic way of doing it, if you like. <coughs> So this is affine one space and one point at infinity. In fact, if you want, you can also think of this as, if you just look at, look at all the lines, then the lines to the origin in R2, they all have slopes. So in some sense, this is nothing but the slope. But maybe I've written it in the reverse order. Uh, maybe this is 1 over slope. Whatever it is, I've written a look at all the slopes. And then one slope that you cannot get is the infinity slope, the vertical line. So maybe I should have written it as b over a, or a over b, doesn't matter. Uh, maybe if I write it as b over a, you would think more naturally as a slope, and then point at infinity. So in fact, that brings me the other point, is that you can also think of this as uh, uh, so, OK. So I skipped a step here. I mean, whatever I've written is correct. This is what I wanted to write. Sorry. I will think of, I will just, I'm sorry, I'll just modify it like this. So this is equal to a over b. 1, union 1, 0. This is what I wanted to write. And then I want to think of this as r, and this as infinity. So this is a one-to-one -one bijection with r, meaning that you give me any real number, I can write down a number like this. And uh, how you write it as a or b doesn't matter, because they will all correspond to a colon b, and they will all be equivalent because that is built into my symbol. So actually, I didn't uh, quite specify it, but it's there in that definition. I'm looking at one-dimensional subspaces. So that automatically means that this n plus 1 tuple is equal to this n plus 1 tuple. I mean, this, I mean the one-dimensional subspace generated by this and the one-dimensional subspace generated by this is the same. They are, they are giving you the same lines. So that is part of my notation. My notation is that this, when I write square bracket like this, it means that this is the same as this. And they, what I'm really looking at is the one-dimensional subspace formed by them. And therefore, this gives me a one-dimensional subspace. But really, don't think of them as one-dimensional subspace. Just think of them as ratios. When you think of them as ratios, then this is just a real number. And this is the infinity ratio. Uh, note, however, that you could have done it the other way also. So you can also, can also write it as, write it meaning P and R. P1R, I hope I wrote one, yeah, P1R as, uh, instead of looking at A over B, you could have looked at B over A. But if you look at B over A, uh, you should write it as 1 colon B over A. And then the only point you miss out, this you can write only as long as A is not 0. And if A is 0, then the first coordinate is 0. And so the missing point is this one. 
So again, you can think of this as real numbers, union, a missing point. I just called it infinity uh, just like that. Uh, in fact, it's convenient to do so. But uh, what I want to highlight is that uh, calling this as a point at infinity or calling this as a point of infinity is just an ad hoc choice. So it just you just decide one of them. One, in one particular coordinate, I'm going to divide it, and that's going to be my point at infinity. So this is what P1R is. Okay. Now we'll come to the main thing, which is P2R, because I was interested in perspective drawing. And so I want to introduce points at infinity in R2. So let's do that. And let's see how this definition squares up. <clears throat> so I'm going to try something similar. So now I have to look at simultaneous ratios of three numbers. Where A, B, C are in real numbers, and at least one of them is non-zero. So this is uh, P to R. So how do I break this up? I want to break it similar to what I did here. So when I'm looking at simultaneous ratios of these three numbers, I will now, uh, uh, <clears throat> again, I need to make a choice. So I'll now decide that I will always divide by the last guy. So therefore, I will now break this up into two cases. One where it is like this. So the last coordinate has been made 1. And so this is when c is not equal to 0. And now if you notice, uh, you don't have much uh, flexibility in changing these coordinates. Here you have some flexibility because the one-dimensional subspace generated by this is the same as one-dimensional subspace generated by two times this or minus half times this or anything. So you could have changed the coordinates. But once you have fixed one of them to be 1, then if you divide by any number or multiply by any number, this coordinate is going to change. So the only way you can keep retain this as 1 is not change any other coordinates. So this part becomes rigid. And so you can't really do anything here. And so this is like looking at R2. You have two fixed numbers here. So this is my R2. So if you start thinking in terms of simultaneous ratios, you can see that there is a copy of R2 sitting there, provided in the third coordinate, I decide to be equal to be 1. And now what remains is when the third coordinate is 0. And in this P1 case, the last coordinate being 0, led to a new point added to this. Here, it will lead to many points. Union, all elements of the form this. Because my third coordinate is 0, and now I have lots of points here. Because, I mean, after all, what are these points? I mean, these are supposed to be one-dimensional vector spaces. So these are vectors and they're all their multiples. Take a vector and look at all this. So 2, comma 1, 2, colon 1, colon 0. For example, if it is, then if that's a vector, then look at all multiples of 2, comma 1, comma 0. So which means 4, comma 2, comma 0, or minus 2, comma minus 1, comma 0, and so on and so forth. So <clears throat> that is one such point here. And there are several such points here. 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. So there are, in fact, depending on, yeah, we are looking at real numbers. So therefore, there are infinitely many points here. If you want, you can think of them as basically, so this can be thought of as a by c comma b by c. That's what this corresponds to. The correspondence between R2, points of R2 and this, uh, on, and this set is just a by, a, comma, a by c comma b by c goes to this one, and this is the same as this. Here also, but now I want to give an intuitive interpretation. And so if you want, you can think of it as a by 0, comma b by 0. But both of them are sort of infinity. So that, of course, doesn't make sense. So in some sense, we have introduced a point at infinity. But what we are, seem to be saying is that even though this is a point at infinity, for different a and different b, there is some ratio between them which still has to be remembered, or which still has to be taken care of. And that will give you, basically, in each direction, one point at infinity. So to make this idea a little more precise, 
Let's do one quick calculation. <clears throat> so, for example, take limit t goes to infinity of Now, this is actually not, doesn't make too much sense. So we will uh, just think of this intuitively. So I'll put uh, brackets here. Because ATBT1 is, of course, a point. If you want, you can think of it as a point in R3. But really, we are looking at the entire subspace. So you are allowed to multiply all the points, all the coordinates by 2, 3, 4, whatever. So we are, what we are trying to do is, we are trying to see how this line, the line generated by this vector, if you want to think of this as the vector at, bt, and 1. So this, line, this vector, as you vary t, look at the line generated by this vector, you will get a moving family of lines. And I'm asking, where is this moving family of lines going to? And if you try to intuitively apply, I mean, just manipulate it intuitively, first thing you can do is, since you can uh, <coughs> simultaneously multiply and divide all the coordinates by any number, let me just divide by t. And so I'll get a, b, 1 by t. And now you can see what I'm heading towards. This will go to the line. So this line, sorry, this family of lines, which is the same as this family of lines, because remember, this bracket itself actually is a notation for a line in R3. This when t varies, this is a family of lines, and it really goes towards the line generated by a, b, 0. I hope you at least find this intuitively reasonable, that this collection of symbols here, a, t, b, t, 1, as t goes to infinity, goes to this one. And so this is my point at infinity in a particular direction, that particular direction is nothing but, remember, <coughs> if the last coordinate is 1, then I'm thinking of it as a point in R2. So this, is, this becomes a point in R2, at, at, comma, bt. And what we are saying is that as t goes to infinity, this vector, uh, this collection of points, at, comma, bt, goes to some point at infinity. And so I will think of, so we, we may think of, So I understand, I understand this will be a bit abstract, but I hope uh, it sounds reasonable as a point at infinity. In the direction or <clears throat> along the slope. y over x is uh, b over a. In R2. I hope this is not too confusing. <coughs> so I start with this collection of simultaneous ratios. I think of one big chunk of that as points in R2. And the rest of the points are here. And I want to say that this point is a point at infinity if I continue to multiply this, this is a point in R2, you can multiply it by t for like 2, 3, 4, you can multiply it by any number, and you'll get a bunch of points. And all those points will, st if as t goes to infinity, all those points will go to infinity, and it's like I have introduced a new point at infinity corresponding to all those points. This is how you should think of a, b, 0. Okay? <clears throat> Not only that, so just to give an explicit example, uh, if I had, let's say my point was, uh, let's just take the point 1, 1. This is a point in R2, and then I look at t, comma t. And as t goes to infinity, I am looking at points which are going like this. Okay. Now the point 1, 1 in R2 in this notation is something else. 
what is it so let's go back 1 comma 1 means 1 comma 1 colon 1 colon 1 so it's the point 1 colon 1 colon 1 what about t comma t so 1 comma 1 is the same as is is the same as t uh, this in this notation it's correspond to this and t comma t corresponds to t colon t colon 1 the last coordinate is still 1 not t and now as t goes to infinity you divide by t and What you will notice is that in the finite plane, in this R2, there is no limit because it's just going out of R2. But I have enlarged R2 to a bigger set, P2R, collection of all such symbols. And in this, I want to say that there is a limit. But of course, uh, why I am thinking of it as a limit? This is an intuitive argument. It's not really a rigorous argument because I have not really set up anything, any calculus or anything here. But we will take that as our intuition. And so limit as t goes to infinity of this collection, t, t, 1, is a point outside this R2, but it's there in P2R, and that point is nothing but 0, uh, sorry, 1, 1, 0. The important thing is the last coordinate is now 0. And that's because I divide by t, so it becomes 1, 1, 1 by t, and t goes to infinity, so this becomes 0. So 1, 1, 0. Okay. Uh, one final remark is that similarly, you can take limit t goes to infinity. Uh, instead of looking at a t b t one, you can also add a constant here and look at a parallel line. So a t plus a naught, b t plus b naught, comma one, uh, colon one. And you can check by just similar argument that this is also uh, a colon b colon 0. So this parallel line <coughs> will be somewhere here. So uh, if one of these lines in R2 was uh, somewhere here, a comma b, this is the line a comma b, uh, a plus a naught. Ah, uh, no, never mind. That's when t equal to 1. So, anyway, uh, yeah, what I'm saying is correct, but uh, mm, okay, let me not uh, stress too much about it. So, if you, if you think about it, this will also turn out to be a line. Uh, in uh, this will also correspond as t varies this will this will also correspond to a, a line in r2 and the limit again will turn out to be this one so uh, let me just uh, for the sake of time i can explain this a little better uh, but uh, for the sake of time let me just uh, uh, summarize things by saying that thus any two parallel lines in r2 approach the same point at infinity in p to r and what do you what do i mean by point at infinity so these are the points at infinity so these will be called the points at infinity i have already said that here these are called the points at infinity these are my points at infinity these are my points of R2. So what I've done is, for every direction, I've introduced one point at infinity. <clears throat> so, how much time do I have? Can I take five minutes. I have another half an hour of lecture. <laughs> okay, can I take 10 minutes then? Yes, okay. Okay, so I define a projective line
in P2R is a set of points so set of points or if you find points to be confusing then elements see what is a typical element of p2r it's a simultaneous ratio like this so in fact from now on i am tempted to call these as points of p2r even though their definition is something crazy but i'll think of them these are points of p2r so these are elements set of elements satisfying a linear equation so look at all triples x y z uh, or actually i shouldn't call them triples all simultaneous ratios x y z satisfying a linear equation alpha x plus beta y plus c z for fixed alpha beta so here alpha beta gamma uh, sorry this should have been gamma gamma are in r and they are fixed and i didn't i am not writing it but uh, not all of them are simultaneously zero so at least one of them is non zero so this is what is called a projective line if you look at it carefully you will see that uh, <clears throat> so thus uh, we may think of uh, we get so if you take any x y z which satisfies this equation what we get is alpha x by z plus beta y by z plus gamma is equal to 0 if z is not equal to 0 or you get uh, <clears throat> or z is 0 and in that case and hence x y z is it's not hard to see that it's in fact a unique point is the unique point and in this case this is the unique point unique element minus beta alpha zero uh, this is assuming uh, yeah if that is if that is equal to zero then this is assuming that alpha and beta are both uh, at least one of them is non zero sorry <laughs> Okay, I'll just assume that alpha and beta are uh, at least one of them is non-zero. So if you look at the set of all solutions of this linear equation, you can break it into two cases. One when z is not zero. When z is not zero, you can look at it like this. And when z is zero, you it turns out that uh, z is z is zero and alpha x plus beta y plus gamma z is zero. So therefore alpha x plus beta y is zero, and so you can get that there is a unique solution like that. <clears throat> uh, what does this do? This tells me that. So why did I break it up into two cases like this? Basically, this side, x by z comma y by z, these are all the, this is all the points in R2. Because x by z, and this is what I'm doing all the time. When given a simultaneous ratio like this, I try to divide it by the last guy. And then I get a point in R2, if I can. So that means these are all the points in R2. So these are all the points in R2 whose x coordinate is x by z and y coordinate is y, uh, first coordinate is x by z, second coordinate is y by z. These are all my points in R2. So that's a usual line. Alpha x plus beta y plus. And this is the point at infinity of that line. So every line in R2, almost all the lines, there's one special case I'm missing, which is when alpha and beta are both zero. Let's ignore that for the time being. Then almost every line is broken up into two, uh, two parts. One is the finite line, line in R2 and a point at infinity. <clears throat> so the line of slope one is nothing but uh, is given by, so for example, the line of slope one is x plus y is equal to zero. 
the line of slope one translated is x plus y plus z is equal to zero. What it really means is that if I divide by z, then this is actually the same as x by z plus y by z plus one is equal to zero. This is my actual line in R2. These are not actual lines in R2. This is actually a linear condition in P2R. So this linear condition in P2R gives me this actual line in R2. This linear condition in P2R gives me the actual line x by y plus, uh, sorry, x by z plus y by z is equal to zero, which is also a line through the origin. Line of slope minus, sorry, these are all lines of slope minus one. And this is a line of slope minus one shifted by one. So <clears throat> you can play this game. Now uh, let me write down a few facts. So now I'll just uh, quickly, I won't go through too much over the definitions. Oops, sorry. I'll just now write down basic facts which come out of this theory. First is, uh, okay, one last thing, one last remark here. Uh, I said a projective line in P2R is the set of all elements satisfying this. It is also the same as such a line also corresponds to a two-dimensional subspace in R3. Remember, P2R consists of simultaneous ratios or set of all lines through the origin or one-dimensional subspaces in R3. Points of P2R, elements of P2R were one-dimensional subspace. A line in P2R is a two-dimensional subspace. And that's sort of suggested here itself. If I give you a linear equation in three variables, it's like a two-dimensional subspace. Except that I don't really look at uh, all the points. I only look at simultaneous ratios. So actually I'm uh, sort of, there's a one whole, whole collapsing of dimension happening here. And I break it into two cases and then I try to analyze it. So, several consequences come out of this. One is any two lines, projective lines, intersect. And that is one big thing. That's one key property of uh, projective space. Any two projective lines in P2 intersect. If necessary, at infinity. They may intersect it in R2 itself, but if necessary, they will intersect at infinity. In fact, if you take two parallel lines in R2, they will all converge, they will both converge towards the same point at infinity, and so they will meet at infinity. So two parallel lines in R2, also when you think of them as lines in P2, which means you have to add the point at infinity, so having added that, then they will always intersect. So any two lines in P2 intersect, no matter what. There is simply no special case. Whereas that's not case in R2, because in R2, two parallel lines don't intersect. So in fact, there's a more general theorem true, which is that any two curves in P2 intersect, but for that I have to first define what's a curve. So very quickly, let me now talk about curves in P2, and then I'll try to wrap up the lecture. So I will just very briefly say, for example, I will just do it by symbolic manipulation. So I've shown you how to go back and forth between points ratios of this type and points in R2, if you can. Meaning you land up into two cases, either they are points in R2 or they are points at infinity. So let's try this for a parabola without really going through all the formal definitions. But let's take an example. So my parabola is y minus x squared is equal to zero. <clears throat> but that means I'm looking at tuples x comma y such that y is equal to x squared. Right? But that's not what I should do. I should now try to go back here. So x comma y satisfying some condition. Well, think of it as x colon y colon one. And then you get a point in P2. So that means uh, you get a condition in P2. So this is the same, well, almost, this is the same as looking at x by z. So I'll randomly introduce the symbol x by z, sorry, y by z minus x by z whole square is equal to zero. <coughs> 
And so I look at, uh, so this, okay, let me, this is the same as, uh, it's not exactly the same, so I will just point out what it is. So instead, I can look at x colon y colon z. z can be 1. If z is 1, I will get back this equation. But otherwise, I am looking at y by z minus x by z whole square is equal to 0. I am sort of trying to go backwards. And I am trying to see that if I were trying to write down a curve in projective space, this is what I would have done. And if you rewrite this, this is like saying y z minus x square is equal to 0. So really, I should look at this polynomial. This polynomial is the same as this polynomial relation. This polynomial relation is the same as this one. Uh, put z equal to 1. And if z is not 0, you can always divide by z, and then z, z becomes equal to 1. It, z is effectively 1. And so the set of all points here, where z is equal to 1, is the same as set of all points here. There's no difference. And set of all points here with z equal to 1 is the same as the set of all points here with z equal to 1. But now I can do something else. I can put z equal to 0 and get my missing point. So let's put z equal to 0. If you put z equal to 0 in here, you get a point which will not come from here, because z is not allowed to become 0 here when you go from here to here, or in fact, even here itself, because here I have put z in the denominator. So when you put z equal to 0, I get this point of infinity. The point of infinity of the parabola is put z equal to 0, and therefore that implies x is 0. Now I have simultaneous ratio of three numbers, all three cannot, are not allowed to be 0, but I have found two of them to be 0, so the third one has to be non-zero, and therefore you can divide by any number you want, so you divide by itself, you can make it 1, so the point at infinity is 0, 1, 0. What is happening? This is the point of infinity in the vertical direction. 0, 1, 0 is the point of infinity of the vertical line in R2. And what we are saying is that asymptotically, well, not exactly asymptotically, but if you look at the slopes of the lines of, uh, slope of the tangent lines of the parabola, the, the slopes are becoming infinity. And so the parabola tangent lines are becoming vertical. In fact, if you draw this parabola infinitely large, meaning you extend the x-axis and y-axis in infinite direction and you zoom out and go several million kilometers away, you will see that the parabola doesn't look like this at all. It just looks like one straight line because it's actually going up pretty fast. We tend to magnify the picture around the origin, so we think of it as curved like this. But if you zoom out, it actually just starts looking like a line. And it's a line going up, and so therefore the point at infinity corresponding to that intuition is 0, 1, 0. So similarly, you can write down, for example, the recipe is pretty straightforward. Replace y and x by y by z and x by z, and re reorganize, and then put z equal to 0. So for example, uh, the hyperbola. I'll just do one hyperbola. <clears throat> just one more example, and then I'll try to wrap up my lecture. So hyperbola, let's take a very standard example of hyperbola. So let's take uh, x squared minus y squared is equal to 1. The recipe is, if you are interested in going to the points at infinity, not just looking at points in R2, then you should write triples, uh, simultaneous ratios, which satisfy a similar equation with z in the denominator. So you put x by z whole square, y by z whole square. What you will see is that you get the equation x square minus y square is equal to z square. This is equivalent to this, provided z is not 0, in which case you can make z to be 1, as far as these simultaneous ratios are concerned. And when you make z 1, you get back the original hyperbola. But now, at point, for, for the point at infinity, you put z equal to 0. What do you get when you put z equal to 0? Gives point at infinity, points at infinity. So here I got only one point at infinity. This was a point at infinity. So here z equal to 0. So from this equation in the affine plane, I went to the projective plane, P2. And for this equation, z equal to 0 gives points at infinity. When you put z equal to 0, you get x square is equal to y square, which means x is plus or minus y. So if y is 0, x is also 0. But all three are not simultaneously allowed to be 0. So y should not be 0. But if y is not 0, you can divide by y. And then x is nothing but y only. It's just plus or minus y. So therefore, you get two points. You get one. 1, 0, and you get minus 1, 1, 0. 
And if you draw the hyperbola, the hyperbola is nothing but like this. What you see is that these are the points at infinity for this line and for this line. Every line has a unique point at infinity and the hyperbola is asymptotically going in that direction and so you are introducing points at infinity for that also. So the, in this way you can enlarge your parabolas and hyperbolas to projective situation also. Okay, now I, I still had one more page so I'll just orally say what I wanted to say. So basically now what you can do is you can do projective geometry. What you should really do is not do projective geometry over real numbers but over other fields. So I'll just wrap, I'll just finish by saying that and why. So for example, you can do it over complex numbers. If you do projective geometry or complex numbers, what will happen is that all your basic conic objects like circles, parabolas, hyperbolas, ellipses, they all become equivalent after some change of coordinates. And uh, basically hyperbola had two points at infinity, parabola had only one point at infinity, so therefore they are different. But uh, in P2R, P is a little more homogeneous object, it's sort of, you can move around. Uh, there was nothing special about the last coordinate here. I broke it up like this, simply by ad hoc choice, but I can actually choose B as my sort of the dividing <coughs> coordinate. Or I can choose A, the first coordinate as my dividing coordinate. And so I can sort of do a lot of changing, a lot of uh, changing my perspective, sort of, so to speak. And doing that, one can actually view your hyperbolas and parabolas in different ways, and then they turn out to be equivalent. They are very similar. And this has some mathematical implications. I mean, somewhat straightforward at this stage, but it turns out there are deeper theorems which rely on such considerations. That's number one. So the first thing is one can do this kind of thing over comp uh, this. Uh, one should do it over complex numbers. Uh, the construction is very similar. It's just algebraic. Don't think of lines. Think of them as complex subspaces, and just think of them as ratios. You can do them over any field. So you can, by a field, I mean any collection in which you can multiply, add, divide, and all. So you can do it over complex numbers, and then hyperbolas, parabolas, they all become equivalent. That's number one. The second one is you can also do it over finite fields. So that's what I started with. You can do it over Z mod 2Z. So that means you can't even draw these pictures because you are just looking at a finite set. So you can just take a finite set, so finite field like Z mod 2Z, Z mod 3Z, Z mod 4Z, uh, Z mod 5Z, Z mod any prime. And there you can write down, uh, you can look at instead of R3, you look at F3 and you do the same thing. You write down lines, you write down curves, except you can't really draw in a neat way, but uh, whatever you get, you'll, be, you'll get a finite set. And this way, <coughs> you can get many interesting combinatorial gadgets. You can get very interesting finite graphs or, uh, okay, I'm jumping the thing, I, I don't have time to explain that. Uh, for example, P2 over, finite, uh, over uh, the finite field of two symbols, zero and one, finite field over uh, Z mod 2Z. P2 over Z mod 2Z itself is, has seven points, one can calculate it. And one can say it, is, it has seven points, and it has seven lines, and you can write down various uh, incidence properties between them. You can also look at various curves in such finite fields, and that turns out to give you a lot of uh, additive structures, which are uh, used in coding theory and cryptography and such things. So just by changing a perspective and uh, you know, trying to change the field and trying to look at things in a different way, you can get many more things, uh, but due to lack of time, I will not talk about any of those things. So, I'll stop here. Thank you. <clears throat> so, uh, when you said that if we zoom out, the parabola seems like just a line. So, is the reverse also possible? When we zoom into a line, it gives some other No, curves. no, 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 no. Uh, what I meant was it looks almost like a line, but I, I don't mean that. I mean, it basically what it means is that if you zoom out, the curve will start looking more like, more like this. And so the further you zoom out, the more uh, horizontal it looks. So for example, if you declare that, uh, let's say you declare that this is not one, but this is one million. And this is one million. 
and now you draw the parabola with these, this, these units, then you, your parabola will virtually look like this. You won't be able to see what it is. You can try it in on your on your uh, uh, on your mobile or on your lap uh, on your laptop if you have one of these graphing calculator uh, graphing programs. Just try it with uh, different scales and draw the parabola, and you will see that it just becomes a thick line around the origin. So it's becoming more and more vertical. This is this is what I meant. But it doesn't mean that uh, if you zoom into the line, you will see something else. No, mathematically, if you zoom into the line, you will only see a line. This is just this is, all I'm saying is that it's coming closer and closer. It seems to be coming closer and closer. But intuitively, all I wanted to say was that the slope of the tangent lines are becoming more and more vertical. So if you calculate the slope of the tangent lines and take the limit as go, as your, I mean, you have to calculate it as uh, y goes to infinity or x goes to infinity, as you, as you like. And if you take the cal uh, <coughs> slope, you will see that it goes to infinity. So it's becoming, the slope is becoming, I mean, the tangent line is becoming vertical. Okay. Almost, but it will never become completely vertical. Oh, so this is why you uh, kept saying almost similar in this. Yeah, 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 yeah. And sir, does when you say that we we get infinity points in R two, are we going into R three when we're seeing at the infinity points? No, actually, it's a sorry, it's a little more uh, abstract. So what we are doing is uh, uh, in R two, in every direction we are at, uh, we are introducing a point. So I should have said that in the beginning. Sorry, I forgot. Uh, in every direction, we have just added a point, but. To make that uh, entire process a little more uniform, we start with that more abstract definition that I gave. So that makes the whole thing a little more uniform. But actually, all I have done is, for every direction, I have introduced a point. So two parallel lines will go and meet at that point. But they don't meet in R2. So you have to go to a bigger set. And that's the bigger set. And that's not R3? No, it's not R3. No, no, it's not R3. Okay. 